like my freshman year at Purdue was the uh, best year and a half of my life. Did you get that? First year. I started out in chemical engineering and uh, saw the light and uh, moved over to industrial engineering. It's probably the smartest thing I did. Well, one, one of the smarter things. And I've, I think I'm on my fourth or fifth career now. Varied different actions and jobs and stuff. And industrial engineering has held me in good stead, not only in those jobs, but also figuring out such things as what kind of car to buy, uh, how I run my errands every day. Um, it has helped me significantly. Now, my objective for today is to have each one of you leave here with just one little tidbit that might be of assistance to you now or later in your life. Sort of the theme of my talk today is, is doing the right thing, no matter what the consequence. As Mark Twain said, always do right. It will gratify some and astonish the rest. Okay, let me tell you a little bit about where I'm coming from. Born and raised in a small town south of Columbus, Ohio, uh, grew up rooting for Ohio State, wanted to play basketball, knew I couldn't play there. 1960, I graduated from high school. That's a long time ago, gang, you know. Um, that's longer than most of your parents have been alive. Um, and so uh, this was when we had the space race going on. Sputnik had just gone up in 59. So being an engineer was cool. You know, having a slide rule on your hip was a chick magnet. <laughs> you know, that guy's an engineer. <laughs> um, so I, my dad said, okay, where do you want to go to school? And I said, I don't know, what do you think? So we came out here and um, I signed up, went to meet the basketball coach. I played freshman basketball and then got fired my sophomore year as the last non-scholarship guy. It's a long story. But that was a significant emotional thing. You know, Coach Katie, you know him? Right before I retired from the Army, I went into his office, and he gave me a signed basketball. And he said, you know, I've never had a general in my office before. And I said, well, sir, the last time I was in the head basketball coach's office, I got fired off the basketball team. So I'm sure it's an emotional moment for both of us. <laughs> um, I went to work for Pittsburgh Plague Glass out in Works 25, Greensburg, Pennsylvania. The plant manager was the Purdue engineer. And he loved Purdue engineers. Ed Behanna, who was captain of the football team, was a mechanical engineer. And Ed and I became the plant managers, Purdue engineers. We'd go all these meetings and stuff, and the plant managers said, these are my Purdue engineers. Yeah, kind of cool. Um, then I figured out that I owed the Army a couple years of my life. So I called the Army and I said, hey, have you forgotten about me? And they said, yeah, we sure have. Here are your orders. So I came on active duty making a lot less money, but I had more responsibility. I don't like doing the same thing twice, so I got to move around, got to do a bunch of exciting things. And I said, I'll stay as long as I'm having fun. So I spent 33 years on active duty in the Army, traveled all around, saw some neat and wonderful things. And then I retired in 2011, worked, went to work for one of my old bosses up in uh, Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota, Alliant Tech Systems, a defense contractor. I worked there for seven years. Of course, interesting uh, on the business side, you know, in the military, you never ask for anything for yourself because that's considered self-serving. So my first day at Alliant Tech Systems, the HR VP comes in and says, Bob, I need to have you sign some papers. And he puts this paper in front of me, and I said, what's this? And he says, stock options. I said, what are stock options? He said, oh, they're cool. The more you get those, the better. I said, okay. Um, you know what stock options are. It's good. They're good. So you mention, if you're out looking for a job and they mention stock options, get all you can. And then, and then I said, what's this? And he said, these are performance shares. And I said, what's that? And these are shares of stock. If we, the company does good, then we all get shares of stock. And I said, well, this is cool. And I said, what's this perquisite account? And I said, well, I'll give you an extra, you know, so many thousand dollars a month. You can buy a car or whatever. And I said, this is cool. You know, I said, hey, this private sector stuff is okay. <laughs> so trust me, there's a bright, shining world out there. And, and remember. Then in, in uh, 2017, I started my own 
a little consulting business, and I've worked for, spent two years working for UPS, trying to, to grow their business, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, uh, Polaris, uh, several other companies. And then in 2013, I wrote a book about an experience I had. I ran a, uh, or as the, the head of a large technical college, in essence, in the Army. We trained about 25,000 students a year on 60 and 64 different technical skills at 11 different installations around the country. And we uncovered basically a crime ring of instructors who were seeing how many young female students they could sleep with. And, uh, and the story evolves about how you uncover these things and what you do uh, about doing the right thing. We'll talk about this as later as you go on. So now I'm on my fourth career. I go out and about talking to uh, audiences like this, to the military. I'm an adjunct professor at an army school, uh, colleges, universities, uh, religious institutions, about eradicating the cancer of sexual assault and its precursor sexual harassment from the workplace and everywhere around us. Because it is a cancer that's uh, impacting on individuals and organizations. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Speaking of that, pop quiz. See, I was a graduate assistant in this course, 1966. I wrote all the quizzes for the, that's when the, the head of the school taught it, so I wrote all the quizzes and stuff. We always had a quiz. So here's your quiz. What's this? Vising, right? Vising. What do you use it for? Anybody? Huh? Okay, you get 50% credit. This is the latest date rape drug. If you don't believe me, Google Visine is a date rape drug. You squirt this in a, in a woman's drink. She knows exactly what's going on, but she's incapable of keeping you, keeping the man from assaulting her. This little thing right here. Life is, it's a tough world out there for young folks growing up today, and, um, and, and we'll chat a little bit more about that. Let me give you some tips. You can take with these as you see fit. Uh, you can take, use them or just throw them away. But how many of you are leaders? Tell me. Raise your hands a little higher. Okay. You all get an A. The rest of you who didn't raise your hand get an F. Because you were all leaders. Why is that? Because the first person you must lead is yourself. Okay. Now what is leadership? Okay, let's start with management. We often get management and leadership confused. What is management? Anybody? We probably don't use Harold Kuntz's textbook anymore. Huh? See? Uh, that was a book, a textbook we used years ago. And Harold Kuntz says, management is the art of getting things done through others using an organization structure and a bunch of caveats. But basically, Kuntz says management is the art of getting things done through others. Like, you can manage a Safeway, or you can manage uh, a McDonald's. Like, I could manage the Minnesota Twins. I mean, I know who the players are. I could field the team and all that stuff. I could, I could get things done through them. I could get them. But I don't think I could lead them and be a leader to a title because, in my humble opinion, leadership is getting things done through others. That was management, right? When the others don't want to do it, don't think they can do it, and or it's inherently dangerous to do so, either physically, emotionally, or financially, or whatever. And when, you, when you're in a tough situation and you ask a young person to do something 
uh, if they do, they may not survive, then that's a big deal. So that's leadership. Getting things done through others when the others don't think they can do it, don't want to do it, and or it's inherently dangerous to do so. Now, if you're a leader and you want to be successful and you want your organization to be successful, what are just some of the things that you and your organization have to do to be successful? What do you have to have? What do you have to, what do you have, to have to be a good industrial engineer? You have to be competent. You have to know what you're doing. Okay? You have to know all those things that I use know now. You all know much more sophisticated stuff than I did. I mean, Dr. Lillian Gilbreth was one of my instructors. That's how far back I go. <laughs> so I think, my humble opinion, competence. Now see, we got a problem already. I've reverted to my true calling. When you make general in the Army, they send you off to this thing called Leadership at the Summit. And, they, and uh, I did mine in Colorado Springs at the Center for Creative Leadership. And you go in there, there's 20 people in the class, no two people from the same career field. And you uh, work Monday through Thursday. You're in a classroom, you do, you do staff studies and that type of stuff. And you have your own personal psychiatrist that monitors you through a two-way mirror. They give you all the tests. You know, I'm an ESPN. No, that's a sports channel. Come on, guys. I'm an ISTJ, like every other Army officer. Um, and so the last Friday morning, you have four hours with your psychiatrist. So I sit down with this lady, and she said, you're going to be a general, huh? And I said, yes, ma'am. She said, We've never had a general with a profile like yours before. And I said, well, what does that mean, ma'am? She says, we think you should consider a career change. So I've been in the Army 26 years by then. You know, I'm no spring chicken. And I said, well, what do you think I should be? And they said, we, she said, we think you should be a school teacher. <laughs> what do you think about that? And I said, I don't know. You're the expert. Why don't you tell me what I should think? And it went downhill from there. It was a very bad four hours. <laughs> but I do have that little, I get off on a roll here and I start to preach. So I'll try to, try to not do that. But anyway, come. What's the second one that you have to, as an individual, those, a trait that you have to have? Huh. Your character, right? So number two is character. Gang, you know what the number one selection criteria today is in the private sector for major jobs? Character. But most large companies for senior positions don't necessarily care where you went to school or what your background is. They want people with character. You know why? It costs them so much money to get rid of bad people with bad character. I was having this conversation with the athletic director at a Division I school. And he said, yeah, right, it cost me $5 million to get a new football coach. So character is the number one. Now, what is character? Anybody? A famous Purdue guy defined it. Huh? Famous Purdue guy. Basketball player, later coach at UCLA, John Wooten said, character is what you do when no one's watching. Character is what you do when no one is watching. And he also said, be more concerned with your character than your reputation. Because your character is what you really are. Well, your reputation is merely what others think you are. And this all ties in to integrity. And that's the quality of being honest and fair. Who takes away your integrity? What kind of people take away your integrity? Anyway. Good. That's the right answer. No one. You give it away. 
I remember in the Army we had this thing called quarterly droppage. Every, every uh, calendar quarter, you could delete from your property records one sheet, one pillowcase, one blanket, and something else uh, without any, anyone having to pay for it. So one day, my supply sergeant, first time my supply sergeant came in, said, sir, I need to have you sign this. And I said, what's that, Sergeant Morgan? He said, that's a quarterly droppage report. And I said, what's that? And he said, well, um, we're allowed to drop from our property records so much uh, linen uh, each month. And so we, we, we write this off, and then we collect the, in like a little kitty of, of uh, losses. And then if we need something, we can replace it, and no one has to pay for it. And I said... So you want me to sign a piece of paper that says I lost one pillowcase, one sheet, and one blanket, and I really didn't lose those? He said, that's correct, sir. That's what everybody does. And I said, I'm not going to sign it. Your signature is your bond. When I came in the Army and you go out to the post exchange or base exchange, if I was in uniform, I didn't have to show an ID card or anything else to cash a check. As an officer in the United States Army, my word was my bond. And that's what your bosses are expecting of you. So that's why I spend a lot of time on character. Now, the third one is chemistry. And that's what I hope the guys have tonight. <laughs> Everybody's on the same team. We all work together. Common effort. If you think you're going to get ahead in an organization by going it alone, stabbing people in the back, maneuver to get ahead, wrong answer. Generally, usually, organizations are just as good as the weakest person. So it's up to, it's up to you all, up to all of us, to help those who aren't performing to come up to standard. So we're, all in this, we're all in this thing together. If, there's a, if there is a, a problem in the mechanical engineering school at Purdue, you know, somebody stealing money or something, then everybody in the ME school is going to be looked upon as bad people. And that's what happened to us at the school I, I uh, uh, commanded. One percent of the staff and faculty did, were doing bad things. One percent. But everyone in that organization suffered as a result of that. Not just, not just the victims of the assaults, but everyone just by association. So chemistry. And the third one, what IEs are really good at. I missed spell check. I think that's right, curiosity. That's if you know your job, if you know what an industrial engineer needs to do. You have the proper character. You know you're going to do the right thing all the time. And you know you're a member of a team, and the team is going to succeed or fail based on how we all do. Then you can be curious about what's going on around you. And if you see something wrong, you got to correct it. Proverbs 27.6. Wounds from a friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. So if you see somebody cheating on a test or falsifying something, or doing something wrong. You gotta call them out on it. Friends don't let friends drive drunk. Friends don't let friends steal money from other people. Friends don't let friends sexually assault or sexually harass their friends. Make sense? So those are the four C's. If you have those, I think you'll succeed. Now, what are the four things that'll get you in trouble as a leader or your organization? Let's talk about the four B's. What will get you in trouble, either as a student in industrial engineering, or as a manager of a large corporation, or as I can tell you about some CEOs in Fortune 500 companies, what will get you in trouble, or your organization in trouble? B-O-O-Z? <laughs> e, booze. Booze or drugs will get you in trouble. And that ties into character. Hey gang, I'm on Facebook and I do all this stuff, LinkedIn and all that stuff. 
And I see my, my, some of my friends blowing away in bars and stuff. That's not cool, gang. Because HR people look at that stuff. Okay? And there's still some old folks around like me that, uh, that say, if you want my respect, you have to earn it. They're not all millennials, who say, like you all, who most of you say, would say to me, I deserve your respect. Okay? Because who I am. But there are enough people out there who consider this character and the booze thing. What is the second one? B O Y S slash G. How about boys and girls? I don't mean to offend anybody, but we have to we have to have things start with a B. The third one is B U C K S bucks. Dipping into the till, uh, taking bribes, something to do with money. You know, I say, you know, if if you're in business, you will. No one's going to put you in jail. If, if a major program you have loses $10 million. But if you claim $10 more on a travel voucher than you're authorized, you'll probably get fired. You know? So, so it's, it's another sign of integrity. And, then, and the fourth one you'll never get, so I'm going to tell you. Balance. And I give this talk to politicians, and they say, oh, no, 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 ballots are good. That's how we get elected. What do you mean ballots are bad? This is when you're so political in, in your organization that you backstab, maneuver, try to move around to get ahead of other people instead of working hard and using your God-given talents and hard work and, and so forth. Um, and you just try to be so political. Okay, so the topic today is leadership in a crisis, preventing and responding to crises. So what's a crisis? I mean, I went to great effort to find out the depth. I went to Wikipedia. Hmm? Not bad for an old guy. I Googled it and it came right up. A crisis is a dramatic emotional or circumstantial upheaval in a person's life or a condition of instability or danger leading to a decisive change. In this particular field that I'm working in now, eradicating the cancer of sexual assaults, the damage that, this, that th those actions do to men and women uh, is life-altering, will be with them forever. And it also causes changes in organizations, like replacing football coaches and this type of thing. So our, what we do in, in industrial engineering is we help prevent crises. And we solve problems before they become problems. And we go back to your communications. A key part of a, leader, uh, of a leader being able to do well is you've got to listen to your subordinates and the other folks around you. Words matter. Words matter. In this sex scandal we uncovered, the 12 perpetrators that we sent to court were all African American. The victims mirrored the ethnicity profile of uh, the army and the nation, almost of uh, uh, the army, uh, almost exactly 68% were Caucasian, 18% uh, were African American, and 12 or whatever the right number is other. So these guys were equal opportunity sex offenders. So I am a Purdue industrial engineer. I'm getting ready to brief the NAACP and the Congressional Black Caucus based on numbers that I am not racially prejudiced. 
I mean, I can prove it, the percentages and, you know, and all this stuff and everything. And so I'm, I have my staff sitting around the table, and I say, okay, Jerry, what do you think? Oh, sir, you're going to knock him dead. You're wonderful. You're the brightest person in the world, you know. And, you know, yeah, yeah. And then Elizabeth says, oh, yeah, you're wonderful. So I come to Mary Jo Clark, Lieutenant Colonel, Deputy Commander, African American. I said, Mary Jo, what do you think? And she says, sir, you're coming across as a racist. And I said, what do you talk about? I'm not a racist. And she says, I know you're not, but that's what my black ears heard coming from your white mouth. Hmm? Hmm? And so, to, I use that wherever I go. As a leader, I would highly recommend that you encourage your people to tell you what they really think. And two, you got to be a big enough man or woman to take it. Because that was very insightful. But I was a Purdue industrial engineer, and I proved it with numbers. And I went in, and I got blown away because I didn't listen. And again, leaders who do not listen will eventually be surrounded by people with nothing to say. So part of your challenge as young, young engineers, young leaders, is how do you say things to your boss without offending them to get your message across? Because generally, usually, smart people are much, or young people are much smarter than the older people. I mean, I like young people because they, they know more stuff. And if I go to a doctor, I want to go to a young doctor. I don't want to go to somebody that looks like me. <laughs> I mean, you know. We'll do bleedings to feel better. So. Um, the other thing that, that kind of kept us going through Aberdeen in, in, in the little crisis we went through is um, I had my staff around the table one night. And I said, hey, gang, my military career is over. There's a lot of pressure to fire me and everything. And I said, gang, um, None of you have to stay here with me. I'm the, I, I run the Ordnance Corps. I can get you assigned anywhere. I will get you the highest award that I'm allowed to approve and a maximum efficiency report. But you don't have to stay here and go down with me. You know how many people left? None. They all stayed because we were doing the right thing. And we, and we did basically... What Atticus Fitch said, Finch said in Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird. That's all, To Kill a Mockingbird is right up there with the game unraveling a military sex scandal. Right, Jerry? That's the other bit of advice. Gang, if you think you're going to make a million bucks writing a book and sell it, somebody's got to erase your brain. Unless you're Tom Clancy or Daniel Steele or Jody Picoult or John Grisham. It ain't there. <laughs> Trust me. But anyway, here's what Atticus Finch said. I wanted you to see what real courage is instead of getting the idea that courage is a man with a gun. It's when you know you are licked before you begin, but you begin anyway and see it through no matter what. So sometimes you may feel like you're licked in school or in a course. Just buckle down and charge on. And work hard and get some help. When I, when I talk to military groups, there's usually a chaplain in. And I say, chaplain, Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I will respectfully submit to you that he is the only one who has ever started with a blank sheet of paper. And since Genesis is in both the Bible and the Koran, I think I've covered most of the religions, with, and that's okay. So out there, if you've got a problem, you've got some talented people with Morgan and Elizabeth, come and see them. They're here to help you. Some, whatever problem you have, somebody has already had it. And it's been worked through. So don't, it's not a sign of weakness to ask for help. I've seen too many people fail because they didn't ask for help. And help, asking for help is not a sign of weakness. Okay, let me 
give you a couple tips for success. I carry this one. I've got these going back almost 60 years. And I keep track of what I do every day. I have a to-do list. Anytime I have a meeting, I write it down. And I have a general feel for, you know, if Jerry would say, you know, I remember we had an advisory board meeting back in 2014 or something. I generally know what month and I can find what, what was going on. So take notes. And, and this, and, 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 and gang, and don't repeat this. But if your boss is a horse we are in, <laughs> or the class is boring, write, you know, write your grocery list or movies you want to see. It'll make the person talking to you feel good. Okay? But, but take notes. Uh, I, I remember in sessions I called people in and I said, okay, gang, here's what we need to do. We need to do five things. Number one, bang. Number, if nobody's writing notes, I say, get out of here. Get a piece of paper and come back. Because I spent a lot of time figuring out what I wanted you to do. And I won't tell you, but I don't have any confidence in you that you'll remember anything I tell you after number three. So that gives your boss a lot of confidence that you've listened now, I'm, I'm just kidding about taking, uh, you know, doing your grocery list. But write down what your boss says. There might be some good topics, maybe some bad topics. You can sort that out. You all will not start out at the very top of the organization. I hope that doesn't come as a shock to you, unless, unless your family owns a business. But let me draw this little thing up here. The little blocks up at the top are the leader, and down here is the staff. And what does the staff do? It takes data and information and turns it in to knowledge. Data. Earnings per share this quarter down 50 cents. That's a data point. Information. Earnings per share down 50 cents this quarter because of failed production lot 27 at the Amarillo, Texas plant for the left-hand Mahoney pin. You all know what a left-hand Mahoney pin is? I don't either, but that's a common thing we used to talk about, Mahoney pins. So, so your job is to take that data and information and turn it into knowledge. Now the knowledge here is shares are down 50% because of the, of the uh, uh, Mahoney pin problem in Amarillo. Boss, we've corrected that problem. We're back online and we see a substantial improvement next quarter and will exceed expectations. So the street ought to be happy with our performance. Okay, so the boss now understands. Our job as, as, as worker bees is to help the boss understand what's going on so he or she can make a decision. When I talk to groups of staff, commanders and their staff, I tell them this, I said, you know, the only reason that a staff exists in an organization is to make the, help the boss make good decisions. And, uh, and, uh, and gang, I'll respectfully submit to you that making a decision is the easiest thing in the world. There's no problem making a decision. The challenge is living with the results. When you tell someone to do something and they go out and get killed, you remember their names, you remember the location, and you remember all that stuff. So it's up to all of us in a workplace to help the, to help the boss make the right decision. I remember Rudell Reed. Rudy Reed taught plant design. I don't know, IE3, something. we had to do all stuff. And, and, and one of the, one of the um, uh, case studies we did was what is the optimum location, or where should we build a second plant? So we did the big analysis and everything, and one was Wisconsin and Iowa and all this stuff. And then we got through, and 
And Professor Reed said, that's all very good, but the plant was built in Florida. And we said, why is that? He said, because the CEO, CEO's wife wanted to have a summer home in Florida, so they built the plant down there so they could travel on business expense. Eh? Is, is that? So, so that's an example of how you can make a decision without following a format. So thank you all very much. God bless you. Appreciate everything. <laughs>